Good morning. Welcome to God's house for worship, and a warm welcome to you, especially any of you who might be first-time visitors or anybody who's watching first time on, on our, our internet stream. Today is the second of a three-week series called Faith and Proof. And just to remind you, last week, in the central theme was this. Proof doesn't create faith. Faith is something that is deeper and less logical than that. It is the product of the Holy Spirit. That said, proof is something that's very encouraging for, for those who have faith. Proof is something that can get you at least talking about God's word with those who don't. And, and there's plenty of proof. And tonight, today we'll talk about uh, the proof that, that a transcendent God exists. And next week we'll talk about the very proof that shows that Christ existed. Let's uh, stand and wave to each other. And we're looking forward to the day that we can at least bump elbows, but good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Jim. Let's begin with our opening hymn. Jesus, that your word we are gathered all to hear you. Let our hearts and souls be stirred now to seek and love and fear you. By your teaching, sweet and holy, drawn from earth. To love you slowly. All our knowledge, sense, and sight lie in deepest darkness shrouded. Till your spirit breaks our night with the beams of truth unclouded. You alone to God can win us. You must work all good within us. Gracious Savior, good and kind, light of light from God proceeding. Open now our hearts and minds, help us by your Spirit's pleading. Hear the cry your church now raises, hear and bless our prayers and praises. Father, Son, and Spirit, Lord, praise to you and adoration. Grant that we may trust your word, confident of our salvation. While we here below must wander, Till we sing your praises yonder. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, search our hearts and show us our sins. Lead us to repentance, greater faith, and greater love. For the doubts that we entertain about your existence. Forgive us, Lord. For any doubts we have about your goodness and love. 
Forgive us, Lord. For allowing the world to shape our thinking. Forgive us, Lord. For all our sins of thought, word, and deed. Forgive us, Lord. God is the author of your faith. He has chosen you and will continue to show you his mercy. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Never end in 
refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, hear the prayers of your church, especially in times of persecution, and grant that what we ask in faith we may obtain through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as God speaks to us through his word. Our Old Testament reading comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 through 25. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea in every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised, amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 42. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He answered, 
A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated. sisters in Christ, if any of you are songwriters, I, I will personally chip in if, if you will write another hymn that speaks about God's creation. Because on days like this, I have only one choice, earth and all stars, and I just cannot stand that hymn. Um, but, but it has, as corny as it is, I like the tune, you could use the tune even, but it needs to speak of God making creation because it's important because it's a big part of what God reveals to us not only in scripture but out there in the world for us to see it and observe it and the very fact that we can see it and observe it should be a tremendous comfort to you because you and I we got a lot hanging on this Jesus risen from the dead thing. Let me just speak from my standpoint. If, just speaking hypothetically, Jesus is a fictional character and God doesn't exist, then, then my life's bounded by the few years that I have. And, and what I've been looking for and what I've been living for will not come to pass. And I've based my life on, on what comes next. 
It might be that there's nothing, or it might be that there's some other God that we have completely misunderstood, and then we're coming in blind. So that's a big deal. As far as life goes, well, I've made a career choice. I was a mechanical engineer, now I'm a pastor. Do I think that if it didn't turn out to be true, that my life was somehow worse by being a pastor? You know, not, not really. Not much. I would just have a little extra spending cash and, and I don't know, maybe lived slightly more selfishly. But I don't think that would have made that much difference. But I know there are people who, who are persecuted for Christ, who suffer greatly for Christ. And for them, you know, if Christ is not risen from the dead, we are to be pitied more than all men, right? Just like it says in Corinthians. But it also says this, but Christ did rise from the dead. Paul could say it because Paul saw it. And the God who's made that promise of eternal life to us, the God who we are to live for as disciples of Jesus is not a product of fiction. He is very much observable in his actions. And you can see it in the scripture, of course, but you can also see it in the world. Some may say, though, or tell you, science has disproved God. In so many sources, it's, it's said that way. Let me correct their language. Science has abandoned God. Back in the 1800s, late 1800s, there was some sort of decision made that if you're going to do science, then you must do it based on what you can see in the material world. They adopted a philosophy Materialism is what I usually call it. It's the philosophy, not the evidence, that drives a lot of conclusions that, that leave God on the outside if, if they find a conclusion that impacts God at all. They tell you, oh, evolution this, evolution that, the world is created by by just itself, the product of natural sources. But they don't, they don't ever come back to tell you that what they taught you along the way, they later found to be wrong. For instance, where did we learn, you and I, where did we hear first about evolution and uh, a 14 billion year old universe? Well, probably through textbooks first. Did you ever get a recall on your textbook? They ever send you anything in the mail said, oh, by the way, what we taught you about this experiment, actually, it, it turned out to be wrong. Well, they don't, right? Only your car is required to do that. But so many things have been discovered to be wrong. And as we get more and more knowledge, we're finding more and more things that the scientific establishment used to prop up the idea that God doesn't exist is, in fact, incorrect. They hide those things behind what I would call smoke and mirrors, things that people can't wrap their mind around. For instance, the odds of any one-celled organism coming into being by itself, they're a staggering number. The probability against it is so big that I can't wrap my mind around it, and neither can you. It's exponential notation that means practically nothing to us. You can tell that people don't get it because people play the lottery, expecting to win. It's, it's hard to wrap your mind around one in whatever it is, 300 million. It seems like one of these weeks you gotta make it. But 300 million is a teeny tiny number compared to the odds of what we're talking about here. God's qualities are evident. What is said in our epistle lesson, I want to read this line to you again. He says, For since the creation of the world, 
God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what is made so that men are without excuse. That was true before we had the tools to really look at it. It is even more so now. What do the tools tell us? It tells us that the universe has a beginning. A lot of us make the mistake of thinking the Big Bang Theory is a thing that kicked God out. Actually, the Big Bang Theory is the thing that people who wanted to kick God out didn't want. They wanted a universe that has always existed. Because if it has always existed, then there's time for chance to play its game. The fact that it has a beginning speaks to the fact that there is God. Not only that, such order came out of that bang, if you will, that there had to be extreme order even at the beginning. Who would put that order there? Only a God who is outside of that creation. Pagans and a lot of other world religions would make God as part of the creation, inside of it. But always the God that has been revealed to us through scripture is not inside creation. He is outside creation, transcendent, above it. That doesn't mean that he doesn't work within. It just means that he's not influenced by creation itself. We find that the universe is highly ordered, and not only highly ordered, but finely tuned. If you don't know anything about this, uh, please do go to our Facebook page and uh, ask to be part of the Genesis series. Watch some of the videos that are there. There are numerous, numerous laws that have constants to them. And those constants are numbers that have to be exactly that for, for our universe to exist, for carbon to form, for life to form on this planet, for us to exist. It's all just too perfect to be by chance. We live on the most fortunate planet, and God has been active and is still active here. He upholds this creation by his right hand. We sang, and that is true. And especially true as you look at living things. But it is mathematical and understandable, and there is no reason why that should be true except by God. You look at the simplest life form, as I mentioned before. Once upon a time, Darwin, for instance, he thought it was just a bag of gel that he called protoplasm. Now that we got the tools, we can look inside, and what we see is basically a little miniature factory. DNA that unzips itself and then copies onto another molecule called RNA, that it then assembles all the proteins that we need in our body. And by the way, there are thousands of proteins in our body. It's not just protein, fat, and carbohydrates like your cereal box says. And it makes each one, and then it folds them up so that they take on the shape that works. All of it happening and then transporting, and it's it's just like a factory. How does that come into being by chance? Well, those who don't want God around would say, well, I I don't know. But we'll figure it out someday. Will we? Not when the answer is clearly that some mind has to do it. And they've excluded that idea from the get-go. Even the thing, they want to forget the beginning and then jump into the middle and say, but we know how we came from apes and we know how we came from pond scum to be apes, to be people. Natural selection, it's genius. Natural selection is not that genius, really. It does do something. It, It does change living things at one level, at the species level. 
It can't change it from, you know, pond scum all the way up to human level. And the reason why we know that is that natural selection has to be able to select something. What does it select? Well, your DNA, your DNA mutates occasionally. Occasionally it happens by itself. Occasionally it happens because of an outside influence like radiation. And mutations have been observable. And what they are almost always is one of three things. Completely destructive and fatal. Neutral and not accomplishing anything. Or destructive to the information that's there, but oddly enough, helpful in the moment. That's what bacterial resistance is for a bacterium to, to antibiotics. It's not making into a, a new, they call it superbug. It's super in the sense that it can resist things, but it's not super in that it's more advanced than the bug before. It just happens to have damage that defeats the chemical we created to kill it. That's it. It happens in humans, too. The most notable is sickle cell anemia. Definitely damage. But oddly enough, it lives on because it gives one advantage. It doesn't allow you to get malaria. So, are there ever good mutations? Not that we've observed, certainly not at the rate that it could be selected to make human beings out of pond scum. And yet that is where you hang your hat if you don't want God to be around. And then the third, probably the biggest thing, there's the cosmos, there's living things, and then the third thing is this, your consciousness. The very fact that you can listen to me and understand and think about what I'm saying, the very fact that I'm actually standing here and not lying in my bed. What is consciousness? They would tell you, you don't really have one. You are just brain chemistry and brain structure. You don't even have a will. You didn't pick to get up this morning. You did it because your brain chemistry made you do it. You didn't choose your route. You didn't choose your seat. You didn't choose to put a mask on your face. You're not going to choose where you go to lunch. You're simply doing what brain chemistry forced you to do. Do you believe that? Because I don't. That's ridiculous. And yet that's the outcome of those who say science has disproved God. So if you want to buy it, prove it to me. All these things, in the end, they're held on to because, because God is hated by humans. Our sinful nature resists him. And like I said to you last week, if that's not true of you, that's only not true because God's reached you. Praise God for that. So what if you have somebody who is a loved one to you and yet they are just hardened in their position that God does not exist? First of all, you need to recognize this. They are hardened in that position for some other reason beside proof. Try to find out what that other reason is. Yeah, talking to them about this is about as fun as sticking a needle in your eyeball, I'm sure. Yet every once in a while, out of love, you'll even stick a needle in your eyeball. Ask them when they first concluded this. What was going on? Why would you pick this theory over that? How satisfied are you, the fact that you don't know how evolution got started? Or what is your explanation for a finely tuned universe? And expect that when you ask them these things that they will be angry. Everybody that I've corresponded to, and luckily it's always been by a computer, so emails and so forth, they're always angry. They write angry. 
Why are they angry? Because you're messing with their worldview. And it's tough. When your worldview is being messed with, you don't know what's real anymore. You don't know what's important anymore. It is a lot like talking to somebody who's mentally ill and completely out of touch with reality. Now, I'm not talking about depressed here. I'm talking about schizophrenic or something like that. They look at their world and they are certain what they see and what they hear and what's going against them is happening, even though none of it is, and it's clear to you. And when you speak to them, they hear your words, but they think you've got the problem, not them. So whenever you mess with somebody's worldview, their first response is to think you're the one with the mental problem. And in fact, that's been said about Christians. I don't understand them. They must all have some sort of mental illness. Beware that society continues to say that and actually begins to treat us that way. But the fact is, it isn't a mental illness. It is a spiritual illness. And it's not one that we have. It's one that we had. And it's one that is very common in this world. Only God's going to overcome it. But you can do this. You can sow the seed of love and truth. Love them. Be patient with them. Listen to them. Put forward what you've heard and know to be true. And just let the Spirit take it where it needs to go. In the meantime... Don't let anybody belittle your faith or beat you down or instill doubts. Not only do you have the word of God, you have the lion's share of all proof. We are not on a wishful thinking ride to some fairyland after our death. We are following God's promise. And God's promise is true. May we hold to that promise until it is ours. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand now and join me in our confession of faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the children's message. Good morning. It's nice seeing some of the kids out there, and good morning to the kids at home. And so in our sermon series that Pastor Tom has been um, doing, he's been teaching us about saving faith. Where does it come from? Why some have faith and others don't, how sin, the world, and even science plays a part. And for me, um, I, I've had a saving faith for as long as I can remember. My parents brought me to baptism when I was about a month old. Um, I've never experienced um, not knowing Jesus, that he's my savior and my redeemer. And so when I had kids, I wanted them to have the same experience. It was really important to me. So one of my, so I had my children baptized. And one of my most consistent prayers for my children have been um, that they would never know a moment that they, um, that that they, apart from their Savior, that no matter what happens in their life, they would stay connected to him and know how much he loves them. And so when I read um, passages like I read this morning from our epistles from Romans, it really breaks my heart, um, especially where Paul says, they exchange the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Um, It breaks my heart because I have people in my life that I love very much who do not have a saving faith. Um, They don't don't know how much Jesus loves them. 
And my heart is also broken for people I don't know um, who don't have a saving faith that, you know, when life gets really hard or there's, you know, bad stuff happens, they don't have the comfort of Jesus as a friend and a savior. And, and how people who, who don't have a saving faith, they, they find or seek love and comfort in, in lies and, and things that, that don't last. Um, and so for us, as you know, for those who, who are Christians, who are disciples, you know, out of frustration, for, um, we might kind of re- like be tempted to say, like, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they just believe in Jesus? Why are they so dumb? And it gets really, we're really frustrated. Um, but we know, based on what your know, pastor's been teaching us, is that saving faith is really complicated. I mean, in one way, it's really simple. Um, the Holy Spirit creates faith in us. It's nothing that we do. It's his work in us. But we also know it can be really complicated. Sin throws up roadblocks and barriers. We don't always know why some people um, have faith and, and some and others don't. So what can we do? Is there a better way to respond than saying, why are they so dumb? Well, of course, because it's not a matter of whether or not people are smart or not smart. Plus, it's just not kind to call people dumb. And at least, you know, my experience is if you call someone dumb, they're not going to listen to you, so we're not being effective that way. So as disciples of Jesus, what can we do? Well, first of all, I think we can thank God um, that the Holy Spirit was able to create faith in us and, and just be very thankful for that. And then we can stay connected to Christ through prayer, Bible study, and worship so that um, we always remember and know and stay connected to what he has done for us. And then the third thing we can do as disciples is live our lives as disciples, showing everyone that we belong to Christ because we never know how God is going to use us to create saving faith in others. We can pray for those who don't know Jesus and the salvation he has won for them. We can have a heart and a compassion. We can be, have, like I said, have a broken heart for them and really care and, and pray for them. And then also we can trust in God and that this stuff is in his hands and he knows what he's doing. Because it can feel very big, and it is big, but we have a big God who is there and he, he's already doing all the work. So even though it is the Holy Spirit that does create saving faith, God blesses us as his people and that he allows us to be a part of the work that he's doing, which is um, really important that we're, we're with him, he's using us, and that is definitely a blessing. So will you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, your love for us is so big, and your love isn't just for those who love you, but for all of creation. Lord God, we pray for those who do not know your love, who do not have a saving faith. We pray that you would use us as your disciples to share the good news of Jesus with them. And we pray that everyone would have a saving faith in you. Amen. Thank you. We have the opportunity to give back to God through our tithes and our offerings, which are collected in the back of the sanctuary, or you can also uh, give online uh, through our website or, or through your cell phone. We continue with our offertory. In grateful devotion, our tribute we bring. We lay it before you. We kneel and adore you. We bless your holy name. Glad praises we sing. With voices united, our we offer and gladly our songs of thanksgiving we raise with you Lord beside us your strong arm will guide us to you our great redeemer forever we pray We pray, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us faith through your spirit to trust in you, to trust in the death and resurrection of your son. 
through whom we have forgiveness and salvation. We pray, Lord, that we may honestly see the evidence that helps encourage that faith, Lord, and emboldens our witness that we would not be sidetracked uh, by, uh, by, by, by the various things in, in the world and, and in science that seem to deter from that, but, but to, to see the truth, uh, to see the evidence in the world around us, uh, see the evidence that is there in the science, Lord, of your existence, that we may continue to know and trust in you in all things. Deliver us by your grace so that we may learn patience and trials. Teach us to be slow to judge, quick to forgive, and steadfast in love for you and for one another. You have shown great compassion to us. Teach us to show such compassion to others, that we may welcome the stranger, love our neighbor in need, and be attentive to those new to the faith or vulnerable to temptation. Help us to serve the refugees seeking safety and give us opportunity to share your gifts with those who live in poverty and want. Grant to all the baptized the aid of your Holy Spirit so that receiving your gospel with joy, we may boldly share it freely with those outside the household of faith. Mighty God, give wisdom and courage to our elected and appointed leaders that they may pursue justice, seek peace, and protect life from its natural beginning to its natural end. Bring an end to the threats of terror and violence among the peoples and open all nations to the voice of your word. We pray, Lord, for those who serve in in various ways in our communities and in our country. We pray for the first responders, medical workers. We pray for our veterans. We pray for our military that you would continue to strengthen them, that you continue to keep them safe. We pray uh, for those who serve both at home and abroad uh, from our congregation. We pray for Cody and Katie in Italy. We pray for Abby in South Korea, for Augie, uh, and also for Kurt over in Colorado. We pray, Lord, that you would also protect our schools and, and our students, or our teachers and faculty, uh, the parents, as, as they continue to operate uh, during this time, Lord, uh, that uh, they may be edified uh, through that education as it's a combination of in-person and, and virtual learning, Lord. We pray for students from our congregation in, in college and, and those who study at, at UE and at USI. We pray, Lord, that you would deliver us from temptation and from the, temp- the powers of evil, that we may be faithful unto death and receive from your hand the crown of everlasting life. Whether we live or die, we belong to you. And we pray that you would comfort us with this promise that we may join the company of the saints on the day that you have appointed. You know the weakness of body and soul. Give to the troubled in mind your peace, to the suffering relief, to the sick healing, to the grieving comfort, and deliver the dying into everlasting life. We especially pray this morning, Lord, uh, for those who who are having health issues, Lord, and and recovering from, from surgeries. We pray for Liz and Bryce, for Paula, for Betsy, for Diana Jean, and for Judy, that you would that you would be with them and strengthen their faith in their time of need. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily, daily bread, bread, and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Thine own and burden one.
seated briefly um we have uh we were gonna start it last monday but i wasn't feeling well so we pushed off the start date for a grief recovery method uh, uh recovery gr uh, uh, group that we're meeting with a uh, support group and so and grief comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes you know a lot of times we think of the death of somebody close to us uh, but there's lots of things that we grieve uh, it can be death it can be a loss of income or a job it could be a loss in a relationship a divorce or, or some other kind Kind of loss in a relationship and so lots of different ways that, that we experience grief and so this is just an opportunity it doesn't have to be something major if you uh, just want to meet with a group and, and be a support to others and, and whatnot that would be great uh, but uh, we are meeting Mondays at 10 a.m. over at Redeemer Newburgh at that campus uh, in the lower level there. And if you're interested in, in being a part of this but you're like hey I can't meet during the day because I work or whatever it may be let me know so that when we uh, schedule the next one, we'll meet for eight weeks and then uh, look at starting another group after that if there's interest. Um, we got volleyball, if the weather permits, uh, at Newburgh at four uh, this afternoon. What else we got? Anything else? Well, looking ahead to, uh, it's really loud. <laughs> looking, no, it's really not. Looking ahead to uh, October the 3rd, we're gonna have an event for the congregation, but also for the community. Um, it's a food truck day out there at Newburgh, and we have seats very dispersed so people can, uh, can socialize with people they're comfortable with and yet not be all packed together. Um, and music on that day too, but we will need some helpers, helpers to uh, clean up tables when people leave them, helpers to help direct traffic helpers to set up and tear down. So if you think, I'll, I'll help, please talk to either one of us and, and let us know. All right. Have a great week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.